Hello, everybody. I'm Rebecca Caro, and welcome to another episode of Rowing Chat. So Rowing Chat is the podcast network for all things rowing. And we've been running this show since 2013. And you'll find out why I know that later on in the show when I introduce my guest. But first, a message from our sponsors. Without our sponsors, we would not be on air. And so we rely on you to go to their websites and go and have a look at what they're selling and help us by helping them. Our first sponsor this month is Faster Masters Rowing. They have published two new standalone training programs. These are designed to take you into a competition. There's one program for long distance head races and one for 1,000 meter side by side racing. Each lasts 12 weeks and is designed to fit around the busy lives of Masters athletes. They have in them three core sessions a week, which everyone should do. And then there are up to three additional optional sessions, which you can do as your time and your schedule allows. Detailed explanations are included for all sessions, intensities and the work pieces so that you know what each is going to help you improve. Weekday trainings designed to be completed within one hour on the water. And you can buy your program at rowing.chat forward slash sponsor. And there's a link on the screen if you're watching this in video where you can actually go direct to the website. Our second sponsor are Pregal Rowing Camps. If you're a master's rower who lacks consistent coaching, you can learn how you can row faster with the Pregal Rowing Camp program. These camps give you coaching by experienced world-class coaches working in a small group, so you're guaranteed to get personalized recommendations. You get video analysis and learning how to work with rowing data. Your training and competition will be in new WinTech and fluid design boats on a training lake, which is three kilometers long, in Brno, which is in the Czech Republic, but not far from Prague or Vienna. The first camp's in July 2020, and you can combine this with competing in one of the strongest and largest Masters regattas in Europe, the Open Czech Masters Regatta, and they'll let you use the boats for that too. The second camp is later in the year, and it's an ideal preparation for the World Rowing Masters Regatta, which is in Ottensheim in Austria. More information at rowing.chat forward slash sponsor, or you can go to pregalrowing.com forward slash rowing chat. Now, today, I'm, as my guest, Mike Davenport from Max Rigging. Mike, welcome back to Rowing Chat. Why, thank you. It's nice to be back. It's been a while. As Mike hints, I looked up when Mike is the to his show, which we did back in 2013. Rowing.chat forward slash Mike hyphen Davenport. Who knew? Right, right. And we haven't aged a day since. Neither, neither I love you. <laughs> now, Mike, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background in the sport of rowing. Right. Thanks. And thanks for asking. And thanks for having me here. Um, quick on the background. Uh, college, uh, U.S. college coach for 35 years with the U.S. national team for many years and as the boatman. Um, have a website, Max Rigging, wrote the Nuts and Bolts Guide to Rigging, and have traveled all around the states uh, doing rigging clinics, uh, teaching, teaching the basics of rowing equipment and rigging, and I've done well over 100 of those clinics. So that's kind of, kind of immersed myself in the world of rowing equipment. Uh, and it's been it's been a lot of fun. So that's it in a nutshell. I think we're going to call you Mr. Rigging. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Now, I was just sharing with Mike that uh, this is one of my favorite all-time flow diagrams. And it's an engineering flow chart that starts with an instruction, does it move, yes or no? And the answers flow down through, should it move? Yes or no. And if it should, but it doesn't, it has an illustration of a can of WD-40. And if the opposite is true, the illustration shows a roll of duct tape. 
So, Mike, tell me, is it true that duct tape and WD-40 are the fundamental requirements for any rowing coach or any rowing athlete? Uh, I would say unequivocally no. As a matter of fact, if you're going to use either one of those products, you may use them on your launch, but do not use them on any rowing equipment. Two reasons why the WD-40, which is a really good product, but it's not a good product around rowing equipment because it will attract and hold dirt. And that's one of the things we don't want. And the second thing is duct tape might be great in an emergency situation. However, it's gonna leave a residue and there's really, I would say of all the years I've been rigging and rowing, the only time we've ever used duct tape was maybe twice a shoe came loose um, or I've seen it on gunnels, marking a gunnel for some sort of measurement, catch length or finish length, maybe color tape. The problem with duct tape, uh, it, will leave, it will leave residue. There's better types of tape. So although I love the flow, the flow chart you just showed, and I love the simplicity of it, neither product no, don't have them around a rowing shell. Yeah, the only tape that I think is worse than duct tape is that brown parcel tape. When I see people taping riggers up at the end oh, of a yeah. regatta with that, I'm just like, no, yep. run away. Yep. Yep. Non-recyclable too, so you got to be careful with Fair that. Fair point. Yeah. yeah. Now, one of my goals of inviting you back on the podcast all these years later is firstly, I really should have asked you back before now so my apologies but i want to talk today about rowing equipment and misunderstandings that people have with rowing equipment so the gear that we use is at its simplest level it's straightforward it's a boat it's an oar or oars you have some shoes you have a seat you sit on there's a rigger if you're a coxswain, there are some wires attached to a rudder. And apart from that, it looks very straightforward. But as you and I know, and most of our listeners know, it ain't necessarily so. Talk to me about the sort of equipment misunderstandings that you've run up against in your long career trying to teach us all how to rig properly. Right, right. I would say the, the first one is that uh, old is slow and new is fast. We tend to be a culture society that thinks that, well, the latest and the, is the greatest, uh, the newest is the best. And that's not, not necessarily so, especially in our sport. You know, there's some great innovations that happen. They happen in our sport very slow, but the, uh, you know, I've seen many, many, very, I've seen very competitive equipment that's 10, 15, 20 years old. Uh, if it's well maintained, it can still be a rowing shell. If it's well maintained, can still be very fast for a long period of time. Oars, the same. You know, there, there are, of course, there's the items that wear and and get used, the, you know, the wheels on the seats and the oar locks and those things. The consumables. Consumables, well put. And the friction just, you know, it wears them down. Uh, but overall, as long as you keep maintaining the equipment, there's really no need to think that uh, I, have to, I have to upgrade to be fast. Now, you may want to for emotional reasons or, wow, I like this color or, you know, I... I like the name of this or this brand. I understand that. And if you think it's going to be faster, then, well, it could be. But don't feel like you have to have the latest to be the best in terms of equipment. That's the so first that, misunderstanding. Yeah, That's a really good one. And, in fact, it's the case in point. Right now, I am teaching a bunch of people how to row in single skulls. They can already skull, but they're not confident on their own in a single. And one of the athletes is a new joiner to the club who has a very nice modern boat and has bought himself the most ultra light pair of skulls that are available on the market today. And I have switched out his, his oars and given him a much older, heavier pair 
to use because I want him to understand the concept of weight in the hand. And he has a much greater sense of how much downward pressure and upward pressure he puts on the handles when he can actually feel the mass of the skulls. And I've probably given him an extra maybe kilo, maybe kilo and a half, I think, in the boat. But it's helping him to learn how to control the oars. And sure, in due course, he will stop rowing with those and will go to his super light, beautiful, modern, new things. Is yeah. that the sort of thing that you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. As a matter of fact, uh, a good friend of mine, the late Harry Mann, from New Zealand, a great rowing coach. He and I had conversations, and one time he said, in his opinion, one of the best ways to teach uh, a good catch is with the old making oars. And then once mm. you've established their, you know, a, a proficiency in the catch, then you can move on to the to the newer designs. So often, not only can old be fast, but old older designs can be very instructional, can be very helpful in terms of teaching the basics. And it's not to say that the new designs won't necessarily be, you know, help somebody be faster, but it's not necessarily, if you get the newest, then you will be fast. So I think we're on the same page there. Can you remember how Harry talked about how he teaches the catch? You know what? I just have these fleeting memories. Uh, he he, uh, he came here and he stayed with us for a while, and I can still remember going out in a launch with him. He was teaching my uh, my he. It was my wife's birthday, so he was gracious enough to go out. And uh, he one of the images that he told us and uh, stayed with us was being in a rocking chair as you're as you're rowing back and forth and how that sets you up for the catch uh, so it really he to me he always used the most simple simple uh, uh, metaphors or images to help understand complexity really true and in fact i also have a memory of him standing in the coach boat with a long length of rope which he oh, yeah wrapped orders and he was holding both ends with both hands and as you say yeah. the visualization really helped us to understand what he was trying to get us to do yeah yeah oh that's cool those are all great memories to have yeah now let's get back to the next of your equipment misunderstandings right uh, the second one that I, I see a lot, and this is one of the things I talk to hundreds and hundreds of coaches each year, uh, the tools. Uh, you know, we just need some basic tools. We don't need fancy tools. Uh, we don't need expensive tools. And as kind of with the equipment, we don't need new tools to do the rigging and the adjustments and the maintenance. We just really need some basic tools. And I find that over a period of time, uh, as a culture, we've gotten away from tools, the basic tools, the knowledge of being able to use them. And there's almost, I see so many more of younger people almost having apprehension around some of the tools, you know, the basic ones being a screwdriver or a wrench uh, or a spanner, um, just those really basic, basic tools. And so once we have a conversation about them and give them a chance to actually get them in their hands and use them, I uh, can see these little light bulbs, these go off, uh, these little connections being made. Uh, so I think that's the second misunderstanding is that uh, you have to have this already ingrained proficiency with tools to be able to adjust the equipment. And that's not necessarily so. You can learn it easy. Uh, and most of the tools that we use are, are natural. I mean, uh, to me, there's nothing more natural to, than to have a wrench in the hand or a screwdriver in a hand and just, you know, the feel of them. Uh, again, we don't have to have fancy things, just basic things. So that's Let's the second. Let's talk a little bit about one of my pet bugbears, which is people over tightening rigor bolts. Oh, yeah. How do you teach people the correct tension to do up a nut and a washer onto a bolt? Right, right. So that's, I, I do, I use my fingers for that. 
So, for example, when the uh, when there's a nut on the boat, a rigger nut, and you want to get it the correct tightness, especially on race day when people are pretty energized and they have a lot of extra adrenaline floating around, I say it's two finger tight. So what they do is they put the wrench on the nut and then they pull down on the rigger, uh, I'm sorry, on the wrench until their fingers start to bend. So it's only two finger tight. So you're kind of hanging a little bit on the wrench and then when it's tight, your fingers will just kind of straighten up. For the nut or the bolt, depending on the design that's on the top of the rigger, which we often the have. Top nut, yeah. yeah. Top nut or top bolt. Uh, that in that one, I say, I have people use three fingers, so they have their th three fingers and they're pulling it with three fingers. The the nut or the bolt again, depending on the design that's up underneath that holds the pin onto the rigger stay, that's where you can use the whole hand and you get the whole hand in there because that's that is a very very critical critical uh, fastener to have very tight. So you don't need to have a torque wrench. You don't need to have any sort of, I've seen coaches have electric wrenches that are set in, or drills where they set it a certain tightness. You can use your fingers. You've got what you need right here in the palm of your hand. Yeah, certainly on um, some of the older boat designs where the shoulders are made in wood, I have oh, definitely, yeah. we have a challenge with one of our boats where the bolts have started to pull through the shoulder because people have tightened it too much, too many times. Right, right. And there's a real easy way to make sure that doesn't happen is you just teach one person how to do it and then don't let anybody else touch it. However, however, on race day or days, maybe that person isn't there, then you're up the up the creek, if you will. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that definitely happens on race days when people are very, very jazzed and they're all set and they just want to make sure it's not going to slip. So they just crank it. But, yeah. I would say avoid ratchet screwdriver uh, wrenches um, oh, yeah. spanners. Don't don't use them. They they sound nice, oh, yeah. and generally they don't fit in that top uh, your middle stay top bolt, which is underneath the rigger. If you've got side mounted riggers, which am I right? You call them Euro riggers. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's Where a that brand from? of the side. Oh, it's a brand, is it? Okay. Well. In we call theory, them side mounted, side mounted or wing, two varieties. <laughs> well, the you know the it, supposedly here's here's the here's the the quick little two cents on that is supposedly that was a design that came about by Empacker that was spread around Europe quite and and I remember when it first came out it's it's a quite simple design and it works really really well uh, and so here in the States, everybody said, oh, it's from Europe and it became very, very fancy in terms of, in terms of the, uh, the uh, karma behind it. Everybody was excited is something new. And if the Europeans are using it, if the Germans are using it, and, you know, they're winning, it's got to be great. So we started calling it the Euro rigger and that caught on. So that's basically the side mounted where the, uh, the pin sits right on this flat platform or a sill and can easily slide back and forth, hence the Euro Rigger. Aha, uh -huh. so it's more about the pin rather than the fact that it's mounted in the side of the boat as yeah. opposed to across the deck. Uh -huh. Yeah, because yeah. you can see, you can. Th there are other side-mounted riggers that don't have that pin. Uh, no. if, you, if you remember the old, uh, say, Carbocraft, the old Vespolis, uh, even the old Pococks, they would have, uh, they would have it so that the pin would actually go into a tube uh, and so that was quite a bit different. So this this was a nice innovation, having that flat sill. It's very common now. So we're talking today with uh, Mike Davenport of Max Rigging, and Mike and I are talking equipment misunderstandings, and we've covered off two. The first one was new equals fast and old equals slow, which has been successfully debunked, I believe. We then talked about rowing to the thought that you need lots of sophisticated gear in order to rig. Mike, what's the third misunderstanding? Right. This is the one 
that I probably have the most discussions about, the most calls, the most emails, the, uh, the most heated conversations about is the rigging numbers. You know, what should my numbers be? Should I, uh, you know, should I have my spread at this number or that number or span? Should I uh, have my or to this length or shorter or it just goes on and on. Uh, so the, the, the misunderstanding part about numbers is that there is a set number that's perfect for you and that you will need to spend the rest of your life finding that number. And that's not the case. The case is there's a range of numbers. Let's talk about spread or span here. There's a range of numbers that will be appropriate for you. And depending on how you adjust your other numbers that you'll find a good, a good solid place for it. However, it's just a place. It's not a magical place. It's not a place where speed will suddenly come to you in waves. It's just a solid place. And I've seen this happen quite often where uh, people will uh, have a less enjoyable and less quality experience with their rowing and arguably less speedy experience when they focus too much on the numbers instead of just finding a place that they can put their numbers, uh, adjust the equipment, I mean, and then adjust their rowing to that. So I see so often, I, scholars more, maybe more, uh, I'm going to hedge my bets here, uh, maybe more than sweep rowers, but they're often really uh, trying to find the leverage numbers that are best for them. Uh, so much so that that's almost a common currency that they're always uh, willing to uh, trade with each other, you know, trying to figure out who's at what span and what or length and what's the overlap. And the misunderstanding there is that this, it's absolutely critical to have it right. And it's not. There's a, there's a range and uh, it's more important that it's comfortable. It's more important that you find a place that the numbers work for you in terms of comfort, and then you can go there for efficiency and speed. Uh, I do I do see a lot of a lot of rowers, especially uh, high school in the states, uh, where they're not comfortable, where the rowers themselves really are struggling, uh, not because of the uh, endurance that's required or the effort level but because they're just not comfortable with the equipment. It's not right for them. So. That's a really good point that you make. I have a of all ages and sizes align themselves with what they think international rowers use. And often internationals will share their oar lengths or their inboards or their spans or you know, their rigging numbers. And people forget that unless you happen to be of the size, have the heart, the VO2 max, all of those amazing attributes which top athletes have, that in all likelihood, the rigging numbers for you and for them will not be the same. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And I remember uh, Hart Perry used to every year would come out with the uh, numbers for the world championships. As a matter of fact, I can remember help measuring some of the boats at the worlds and those numbers would get published and high school, I remember more than one high school coach, that's what he would uh, adjust his equipment to for his high school rowers. Um, and I, I overheard a conversation at one of our conventions one time where a, a national team coach, when asked what his rigging numbers were by a high school coach, asked, he returned a question to the high school coach, said, are you coaching genetic mutants, highly gifted genetic mutants. And the high school coach said, uh, no. No, said, regular kids. <laughs> yeah, he said, then you don't want these numbers and I'm not going to give them to you. So, you know, that's, that's a good point you make, yes. One other point to back that up. I was present when they had the World Rowing Championships. I think it was 2005 in the UK. Uh, Rosie Mae Glothling led a 
campaign and they measured every single boat in the boat park that each country allowed. Not every country allowed it. And there's a spreadsheet which detailed their findings. And what was amazing was the intense similarity. Yep. The vast majority of the women's eights were rigged on a near identical span, near identical all length and inboard. In fact, the main differences, as far as I could tell, were in the spans and not privately, but between you and me and everyone who's listening, it's my view that the variations were not intentional. They were a lack of consistent rigging by the part of the um, yeah. crew. Yeah, yeah. And, and there are, I would say, as you get up the level of the hierarchy of coaching, so you start getting to the, you know, the top levels, um, there becomes almost less a dependency on the of specific numbers and more so than the training you know though uh, we have a we have a wonderful coach here mike tady and i've had a lot of conversations with him and one of his you know I, I remember somebody asked him what type of ore do you buy and he says um i just call the manufacturer and i say give me vanilla just give me what everybody else is buying the most common ore, and we'll make it go from there and yes. you know that I, I i i think there's something very refreshing about that uh be, it, very freeing also because when you realize like oh okay if i have what everybody else what if i take that out what's in terms of getting fast what's more my control well your your conditioning and your training and your technique and such yes the other area that i feel very strongly about is that clubs do not pay attention to rigging boats that their beginners use and right. i think it is almost more important that beginners have consistent rig and understand the basics of why they are sitting where they're sitting and why their oars are the length that they are, and how to spot whether a button has slipped, for example. And they may be in the, back to your first point, the older boats, which are perceived to be slow, but actually, if you're gonna teach someone how to row, they need good rigging. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll add to that, from a club perspective, if you want to get the most for your, from your investment, that a good maintenance program, just keeping things clean will not only extend the life of the equipment, but will also make them faster. You know, a, a clean boat on the outside and a clean oar lock is arguably faster than a dirty one, but they'll last a lot longer. So in terms of and this isn't just clubs. I see this in the in the uh, school, uh, uh, schools here, uh, high school, colleges, and such. That they also some programs take very good care of their equipment. Other programs not so much, and they're they're losing uh, not just speed but longevity and money. Yeah. And we're talking basic a bit of detergent and some water here, oh, yeah. Yeah, a, yeah, yeah. which is complicated washing yeah. up liquid. Right, right. And, and a bottle of bleach, you know, if you if you have bleach and sponge and rags and a bucket and water, you've got it covered, uh, especially the bleach from a dis disinfectant standpoint. That's really important. We talk about that. I've got you know, on my site and, and other places, you know, what you should be doing in terms of taking care and in today's you know, with all the concern about health concerns about communicable diseases and such, um, yeah. you know, it's it's really, really important, really important. Thanks for mentioning your website. So um, the website that uh, Mike maintains and most of his thinking is through is called maxrigging.com. And Mike, I've just, oh, I'm going to do my best to do this correctly. Um, on the website, can you just talk us through when someone comes here for the first time, what should they be taking a look at? Right, 
most of most of the time when people come to the site, and we know this because we've been told, and also we can see some of the analytics, uh, they come there with questions. And so I would say right off in the middle, you can see the the free videos and the free articles that's right up there on the very top menu. That's that's a great place to start. And you can scroll down. We have dozens and dozens of videos uh, that cover all aspects on how to do things, why you should do things. Uh, you can see they're divided up into different uh, different areas. So that's a great place. And, and it, you know, some people prefer videos. Some people prefer text. You can go over to uh, come back to the articles and then you can see text. I have, you know, I have my books on the side. I have the rigging course on the side. But those two places, the videos and the articles, I would say that's where people can go to right off the bat and see. And there's a search bar down there and then see if they can find uh, answers to the questions. Now, I noticed because I've been to your website a few times in the past that obviously it's uh, been refreshed recently. And I'm intrigued by this rigging tools for newbies. It says rig better now. And oh, it's not going to let me have a look at it. Um, tell me what's in this course. Right. Uh, my wife and I did that. My wife is a longtime rower, but she's also a uh, a civil engineer or recovering civil engineer, she says, and a teacher. And so we decided, uh, we heard so many questions, and I, we'd mentioned this in the misunderstandings, but we heard so many questions from people about the tools. And so we came up with a very basic course. I mean, it's very basic. It's like, what are the turning tools? What are the measuring tools, what are the cleaning tools, and how do you use them? It doesn't cover uh, rigging numbers. It's not going to show you how to adjust the pitch on a fluid design or a different, you know, a resolute or anything along that. It just shows you how to use the tools properly. And as I mentioned before, I, we see so many people that are, are almost apprehensive about some of the basic tools and we've had people go through the course and they really like it and it's helped them you know just kind of get an understanding and i think for people who are new to the sport that it may the, the course makes a difference but also having that basic understanding however you get it of tools it almost takes some of the pressure off when it comes time to sit and make adjustments or repairs to a boat so that's our that's that little course there. Fantastic. So the URL for that is off of maxrigging.com. And uh, we will put the link in the show notes. So anyone who's listening afterwards in the audio format can. Thank you. It shows you what the different chapter headings are and what each lesson comprises. So it'll give you a much greater sense than I'm able to convey now about what Mike has shared of his deep knowledge of rigging. So let's just recap. Equipment misunderstandings that when you're president, when I'm prime minister, Mike, we will we will fix oh. up the whole of the rowing world. Okay, All right. So the very first one was that new is fast, old is slow. That's, as we talked about, not so. Second one was tools, the basic tools. You don't need fancy, you don't need expensive tools to do the things you need to do with the equipment. And then the third thing is rigging numbers. There, there's basic, there's really basic numbers that you can use, set it, and then focus on the other parts of your training, your technique, and your journey in rowing. And then just be aware that those numbers may be different than other people, but so often they are similar. You know, somebody who's 6'4 will obviously have a different height on their rigger than somebody who's 5'4. However, it's not going to be greatly different. And, you know, the other numbers may not be different at all. So it's one of those things. And, and feel free to experiment with your numbers do some 
testing. And you could go to my site for the uh, under the videos and, and the uh, the articles, and there, we've got information on how to test your rigging numbers and how to do it properly in a very in a very uh, scientifically based but simple way, so you feel confident in your numbers. Mike, again, thank you for your generosity for sharing these insights. Tell the listeners where they can connect with you online. Sure. Uh, through my website, Mike at Max Rigging. Feel free. I get lots of emails there, and that that's that's a great place. I'm also on Instagram and LinkedIn. So either any of those three, but feel free to send me an email. I love hearing from people, and I respond to everybody. Well, there's a commendation uh, for you. Mike Davenport. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you. And to our listeners, please support the sponsors on rowing.chat forward slash sponsors. And till next time, goodbye.